Good evening, everyone. Tonight's speaker is Jerry Nelson. He is a professional horticulturalist. In the 1980s and 90s, he co-owned the Town and Country Garden Center and currently owns Classic Gardens Landscape and Design. Jerry's hobbies include growing lilies and grapevines and teaching his granddaughter, Izzy, to garden. Here's tonight's speaker, Jerry Nelson. Thank you. It's been a while since I've been here. Izzy wasn't around the last time I was here. Um, and we were up there this weekend and uh, <laughs> we did pumpkins. So Izzy took all the seeds out and we baked a few, but most of them we planted around the yard. <laughs> so we'll see what happens with pumpkins up there next year. She's in the Twin Cities. Um, I'm going to talk tonight. I got the email on Thursday and it was on, on doing things, getting ready for winter. And I thought we were doing season extenders. <laughs> So I put in some things, we'll do some things at the end, and we'll talk then about putting your garden to winter or what I do. Everybody I think is unique. Everybody has a different way to do it. If you're successful with what you do, then I would tell you, don't listen to me, do what you've done. Okay, it's if you've had problems or if something hasn't worked well and you think you need some things to change and do some things different, maybe I can add some insight for some of that. So we're going to talk first about kind of season, season extenders. For sure, we have had the season extended with what? Growing degree days in September and October. Uh, September, I think we were up, over last year we were up almost 150. And in October now, so far we've been up and I think we're up 30 or 40 in October. So September and October for the season. Uh, uh, without the radio show, I've got a tough time now, except for on Saturday mornings now when I get up. I still do my, uh, my observation page, or my observation notes. I still do my what's in bloom, because that's how I put a lot of combinations together. Some of the season extender things have come from that. And so I still put those together and I still look at growing degree days. And growing degree days, you know, are those the measure of our heat units. And so September has been much warmer. October has been a little bit warmer. And we haven't had any rain. Since I planted mums, the end of September, I think we've had like 15 hundredths. So we really haven't, for a whole month now, we really haven't had much rain. Maybe it's coming tomorrow night. So we'll see on that. So on season extenders, can we get a light or no? Is that better? Uh, some of the season extenders, we'll talk, like in your handout, we'll talk about some of the traditional things, things that have been, uh, things that we do every year, or things that you see every year, some of the accessories, and then uh, I had a hard time with bulbs, and I'll show you one, I'm not sure it's a season extender, uh, but uh, it's a season extender if you look at it from summer. <laughs> so a different way to look at it. Uh, we'll look at all the different grasses and then some shrubs and some perennials there and maybe even a few other things that maybe you don't think about. And so uh, this is from last weekend. This picture I took at the Chicago Botanic Garden last weekend. And this, yes, this changes. So this is kind of like, you know, our third season now because this would be You'd have the spring season, then you got summer season, and then you got fall season, which is mums. Mums, which is probably the biggest part of it, but then you see a lot of the grasses, you see the asters, uh, and some different salvias, a lot of different salvias. The yellow to the background there is a salvia. And there's some of the blue, uh, salvia leucanthum, 
Lucantha, I think it's either Lucantha or Lucanthum, and there's some some things there that in that are really some really strong season extenders. Here you got mom's one nice thing, Chicago Botanic Garden, everything's labeled. So at least you can find out what things are. Sometimes I'm going to say, I'm not sure I don't know where I'd ever find them. But you can go to their plant, uh, plant directories and sometimes they'll be able to tell you where things come from. Last year there were some mums that for sure I wanted to use or I thought I might want to try to. They were very different. And when I looked and found out where they came from, they came from King's Mums, which is now in Kansas, but they were six dollars for the cuttings <laughs> for the little plants. So figure out that one, okay? How deep is your pocketbook? So we'll talk about all the different season extenders, and probably maybe what I would consider a season extender is something that shows interest still late after our first frost. So if we had our first frost. Depending on where you were two weeks ago, maybe we've had it then that it was a what? A Saturday night? A Friday night and a Saturday night. Two nights in a row. But if you were right on the lake and still at the airport, they've had 33, so they still haven't recorded a frost. And typically we see our first frost somewhere between the 15th and the 20th of October. So there's Season extenders, when I think of them, I think of not only flowers, but I think of a lot of foliage. You'll see some pictures of some of that. And then some fruits. <laughs> and I was, I, last Thursday, I bought 30 pots of winterberry, Ilex verticillata, and I had it, and I was figuring I'm going to use it for holiday, okay? So we went to the Twin Cities, I come back, I looked at them this morning, and there's not a fruit to be found. They were just loaded with fruits on Thursday. So I don't know what, if the squirrels, or the birds, or what, but I have no fruit on 30 Ilex verticillata. But the crab apples, definitely another ex uh, extension. And then fall color. Some fall color is very early, the ash trees drop so very early. And I have another one of those, the Korean sun uh, pear, which is much earlier than the calorie pear. And that is done. Now as I drive up the driveway, when I drove up tonight, what did I have in fall color? The ginkgo were that brilliant gold. And the sergeant cherry was a real orange. The service berry was kind of an orangey red the Acer grissium, the Acer truncatum, and the Acer triflorum, all in the oranges and the very deep red maroons. So that's some of our tree fall color. I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but, uh, and then all the different accessories. And we're seeing Halloween as being one of those holidays now, and how much decorating do we do for Halloween? I, I'm doing almost as much decorating for Halloween as we do for holiday. But I don't do much holiday. And then all of our landscapes and containers, you know, that's where we're putting all of these season extenders. Uh, traditional things, we'll talk about those. The annuals, the accessories, the perennials, the grasses, shrubs, trees. Okay, and that's the question there. What, do you do any season extenders? Maybe you have them all in your landscape and you don't, you know, you don't do any of the, ex, of the extras. So where's your budget for, the, and for that? When I think of, made, what made me put this in was as I was at the Chicago Botanic Garden, I thought of the mums I had last year, and then I'll show you a picture of a plant that's from Africa that, <laughs> I'd love to use, and I have no idea if, where I can find it, and if I can find it, uh, how expensive is it? So, you know, maybe you only do, maybe you only do the season extenders and things if you've got special occasions coming, or if you're doing something. Uh, we did one of those for a first of November, 
kind of the weekend, the first weekend in November now. And so I, everything is, is mums and kale and cabbages and uh, to me we spent a lot of money. And then again, you know, we, in all of this, season extenders, if you're private or public, if you're private, it's going to be different than if you're public. Because when I think of, I think of Burner, I think of the Chicago Botanic Garden, I think of Albrick, all of those kinds of places, I mean, you know, they're destinations. And now as we see in all the apple orchards and pumpkin farms and all of that, and so we're seeing, I think, a little bit more, and it's, is it, you know, is it these private places that are doing it, or is it public? Or what's the, what's the draw is maybe the question. And then it's just the personal enjoyment that you do because you're not sick and tired of gardening yet. A oh, little hard to see. This is probably my favorite annual combination from this season. Okay, and in here, the foliage in the middle is the Plectranthus silver shield, which is now from seed. And if anyone knows the trailer form of this, Nicoletta, there's a seed form now coming out, silver crest, that it's out for 2016. So now we're not, we're, things are getting a little bit cheaper because things are from seed, a little bit cheaper than, than things from cuttings. But Plectranthus there works well as a season extender. So as we pull our annuals to do some of our fall displays, we'll leave these in. And then the purple is Verbena Santos Purple. And Santos Purple, I see it out this year in the catalogs as being new. Okay, it, it oh, I don't know, I've been using it seven, eight years now. But, and it came out as a seed item, and then they had seed failures and crop failures and everything else. And it does real easy from cuttings. And so I think they lost favor in it because of that, but I see it back this year again now as new for 2016. But verbena, that's the purple. And then we had the yellow in Dakota Gold. Um, Okay, that one slips my mind. Then there's begonias in there in red and celosia, fresh look orange. So that's kind of a, a, a combination. I always use at least three or four plants in a combination. As I was talking to Jean before, the sunflower, Suntastic, the All-America selection winner. Uh, in places where I had it, by the middle of July it was dead and it was gone and I couldn't figure out what I did wrong with a, with a All-America select, Selection winner. But when I looked and talked at Burner, they didn't seed it and they direct seeded it and they didn't do it until the middle of June to the end of June. Well, by the middle and the end of June, I was in secondary bloom already. So I don't know what happened there. Um, Jean said hers, you know, they were a little later so she was a little later, but they look good in August. But when I put two or three or four different plants together in a combination, like for me, my, my sunflowers, the second and third week of July were all turning brown. But there was enough other stuff in the zinnias and the grasses and celosias and begonias and everything else that I put in that I didn't have to worry. In about three weeks, everything was covered and I had uh, my mistake was covered and nobody knew. <laughs> so anyway, now we've got, in the blue in the front, you see the asters, a lot of different asters. I, and there's a lot of different asters because some of them are early. And it seems like the ones that you'll buy that you'll find that'll, that'll do really well with your garden mums, okay, they, they don't seem to, once we get that really, really first hard freeze, the petals kind of turn brown and you're left with um, brown buttons, kind of. But some of the other asters, I got a picture of it at the one in the end and the, the aster as we walked into the building, the aster tetericus, I think, is that aster tetericus, the big tall blue one? I thought it was here. 
Uh, but anyway, there's you know some asters that are up this five six feet. Okay, that you yes aggressive. Well, if uh, if you if you don't throw anything away, you can't plant the aster tericus because it will be in, it'll be the only aster you have or the only plant in your garden at the end. But the ornamental grasses, the annual red penicetums, and then again in here. Uh, there's also the cannas to the back, and actually I have found begonias to be a fairly good season extender. Another shot of the Chicago Botanic Garden, and they just you know do things in 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 big masses, and so as you see them and those big masses, uh, they just look expansive, and it's kind of like wow, it's the wow factor. But then you also take a look. Here, what else do we have? We've also got the, the, the Japanese maples there, and there's some fall color, fall color there, and then you've got green, and there's nothing wrong with green. We've got the boxwoods, you've got all the evergreens, you've got the rhododendrons, and so in all that different foliage that you can add to all of your different colors. Here's a, a container, which again, the Chicago Botanic Garden, but Probably a lot of maybe our traditional season extenders with the kale and the cabbages mixed in with all the mums. But how much color do you see here? Or maybe I should say flower color because you don't see a lot. But the foliage characteristics and the differences in the patterns and the differences in the colors to that give you what you need for a season extender. In the very middle, just above the sign, is probably the color that's in there, and that's with a calancho. And calanchos, uh, I mean, you're going to buy those as, as potted, you know, as the little potted, and I guess I would say at point now, where are you going to find them? It's just like some of the real annuals that we see as season extenders. Maybe we don't see them now, we see them in the spring. And we don't see as many of them now. You're going to have to really find them. I'm thinking of the nomesias the diaceas, the snapdragons, uh, are some of those, you'll, you'll find pansies now, but how many other annuals do we really see and do we really find? So, but the heuchras, you know, how many different heuchras do we have? <laughs> heuchras now, we're find, I mean, more and more and more of them, so you got all those different colors. I'm starting, I'm gonna use one next season called watermelon and some of those uh, different heuchers that I found in some of those kind of rose and reds uh, kind of shades and, and watermelon was one that I see I even seen it uh, this weekend coming home at uh, Down to Earth Garden Center in Eau Claire so and it was just that that it, uh, that watermelon color just stuck out at this point in the season so but I'm not sure the which one they which one is here, but anyway, you got a heuchra here. The annual that's here is wire vine, the green vine that you see hanging, okay, and that's an annual. It's called wire vine, oh, I don't ask me botanical name, I'm not sure I know it. Uh, but anyway, that, but there's uh, the trailers there, you know, for your spiller, filler, th uh, trailer for, for containers. Okay, maybe a traditional planting done with mom's ornamental peppers. And how many different ornamental peppers do we have now? I used the new series called Acapulcos this year and I really liked, uh, I really liked them. But again, the, some of the grasses, that's probably the Carex uh, red rooster, which you don't ever know if it's dead or not because it's always brown. <laughs> but they're a bit more traditional. Here are the use of, of the grasses, the accessories, and the accessories, I guess maybe I'm calling all the pumpkins and gourds and squash and corn stalks and soybean stalks uh, that we've got to be able to use. But you see here are the containers, uh, moms and grasses in those. Swiss chard, another good one, and then the kales, the cabbages in that. The grass, the non-hardy one, that pompous grass, okay. Uh, I don't know, I typically use miscanthus in its place, but 
if you've got a nice big budget, you certainly can use pampas grass. Then a couple of others now as we get into some of those maybe foliage things that I think of as some of the alternatheras. And the alternathera red ruby is the red foliage plant here. It's like that all summer. So that's what I have mixed with uh, begonias and the, the other plant in there is juncus. That's the, the round one, the round leaved one is juncus, uh, which is like some of the ornamental grasses. But the juncus, so the juncus and the alternathera stayed here and then we just ripped everything else out and we put our mums in between. And so it kind of saves us a little bit. I don't know if it saves us a lot, but it, every little bit when you start doing that, you know, helps as you do things that you can save from what you planted in the summer. Another planting from annuals, you see the plectranthus and the juncus, okay, and those stay. Now when we did our mom plantings, uh, the coal, and you can see how many different things, okay, as I mix together. So as you do your annual plantings, if something were to not perform in here, you would never know. And even sometimes I probably, there was salvia in here too, and the salvia looked good early. And then I, the salvia just gets overtaken and it disappears and nobody knows but me. <laughs> but here's our mum planting after we took everything, out, all the annuals out. And there was also some dichondra silver falls right there, okay, and that we left in in some places. Sometimes as you pull everything else out and you work to put everything in, some, it all comes out too. But uh, Dichondra is another good one that will actually extend through the season. Uh, the foliage plant, Helichrysum, okay, and there's a lot of different ones. Again, I don't know who's got, like the, this is a picture of another one from Chicago Botanic Garden and a container of just, I think it's probably Silver Star, but uh, one of those little helichrysums. We typically use them as trailers in our containers, so they may fit. Uh, it's, you know, if you're looking for something all silver and foliage uh, in a container like that, it certainly will fill the boat. And another one with just foliage, as you see artichoke, that's the spiny looking plant there. And then we've got across the front is, are some of the herbs. I think it's sage across that. And then uh, what was in the middle? Trolleus. I think there was a trolleus in the middle. So that had flowers in spring or late spring, very early summer. So it's all, and the geranium, the scented geranium to the right. So that's what, that's just some things with foliage. And if you had maybe just a, a, you know, whether you did just pumpkins or gourds mixed into all of this, or if, whether you had some mums for some color in it, I, that's what you need. And I guess that's what I call, and that's what I would say would be some of our season extenders. Geraniums, the perennial geraniums, some of them turn some really nice fall color. Some of them have that bluish purple leaves all summer too. <laughs> so, but uh, Roseanne, one of those that's got those real blue flowers, turns that real red in the red fall color. Hasn't even, I don't know, some, for the most part they haven't turned yet. But it will be. Some more foliage things that, again, as we had with annuals and then we leave those as we do our mums around. Okay, the accessory mountain. Uh, it's, easy. It, it's all, there's a lot of straw bales in the middle, so it's not just a big whole pile of gourds. But you can just see the variety and, you know, all the different sizes and, and things that we have to be able to use. So as you, you, you just um, allow your imagination to go as to what you want to use and where you're going to put it, 
and how you're going to wrap them around the corn stalks or whatever. Uh, you could take some of those, those gourds and, and make a bow tie out of it around, around corn stalks. So it's you know, kind of just however you decide and what you can do and how, you put them, how you're going to put them together. But how many really, when you look at that, how many pumpkins are there that, you know, that the traditional pumpkin, there, I mean, there's not too many there. It's all the different and weird now pumpkins and gourds and things that all the plant breeders are bringing us. And I don't know how many more we got coming. I know that Harris has got five new pumpkins out for 2016. So, and I'm sure they're not pie pumpkins. <laughs> Then we add to this mix now all the ornamental grasses and the perennial things. Uh, some things here, different things going on. Our annual beds, our annual beds are on the left side, okay, and mixed in there as we mix some of the grasses there to give some continuity to th things is the Penicetum white lancer. Uh, not sure if white lancer actually is available anymore because of it being aggressive. So that one you might not, I don't know if you'll find it or not. I'm still collecting seed and then we seed a little bit of it to be able to have it to use. But it's really, it's really big, it's six, seven feet when it's in flower. So that's the Penicetum White Lancer, uh, it's annual. So then we've got to the, to the, on the right hand side here you've got Sporobolus or the prairie drop seed and you've also got the Calamagrossus, the fall feather reed grass. Everybody uses which one? Carl Forrester, okay? But there's a fall bloomer that uh, I like much, much better. The, the Calamagrossus, I think it, I pronounce it Brachytrica, but it's the fall blooming feather reed grass. And that's the one right smack in the middle. And then kind of behind it is the goldenrod fireworks. So there's some things going on and then Russian sage and geranium in here. And so actually, you know, our mum planting here extends right into this bed and then the, the tree there is a service berry. So we do have some fall color from, from that as well. Another one, a combination that, oh, I don't know, I came across it and now I've kind of been as I look at it and see it, I use it all the time. It's the witch hazels mixed with monk's hood. Because you know the witch, ha the witch hazels, the fall blooming one is really late. But how late is monk's hood? Okay, monk's hood is just coming into flower at this point. And so monk's hood and witch hazel, and it happens every year. It's in my, it's in my notes that this is you know, a combination that works every year. And I think I have about 10 years of all of that, oh, to decipher all of that stuff. But from the radio show, I kept, I kept that bloom page. And so all of those combinations as to what works together and uh, you know, that it don't just happen one season, but it happens every year. Okay, and then we mix all the different roses. Now how many different perennial, how many different shrub roses have we got? You know, and there's more and more of them coming out all the time. So the shrub roses, and they bloom, they'll bloom right up through Thanksgiving. Maybe not a lot of flowers, but they're still, you know, as we get into that late, we really got to stretch to imagine what we got for color and extenders. Sedums, and all the different sedums, Autumn Joy is the, hat in the bucket, the one that we've always used, the one that's always, always available. It's just like in daylilies, you know, what's the one you always gotta have? Yeah, it's always gotta be Stella. Then there's a, a couple of others in the, there's an annual status and also a perennial status, sea lavender. This is the perennial one, but if you can find the annual one, you're probably gotta seed that yourself if you're gonna use, because I don't know the garden centers, anybody that's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna grow the annual uh, status for fall sales. 
It's a great season extender, though, for sure. Uh, bugbane, another one. There's the white, the white bottle brush-like flowers to it for the, from the one that flowers in the fall. Still in bloom. And then the different asters again. Um, I, well, I took this because I was, I guess uh, this again, Chicago Botanic Garden, but the asters um, mixed with dahlias and still the dahlias blooming. So uh, roses, not only knockouts, but nearly wild. Another one of my favorites. Uh, the shrubs, hard to see, maybe a little bit picked out of this picture, but this is hydrangeas. And now in a world of hydrangeas, how many do we have? Again, you know, we've got them two feet high, we've got them six feet high. I, the biggest thing I think is pruning with all of those panicle-like hydrangeas. As you prune them, remember, I guess, a couple of things. Dormant pruning will come on the, on the, on the to-do things for getting ready to winter. You know, do you prune now or do you prune in the spring? Uh, I wait till spring, but with the hydrangeas, again, I think pruning is the key to those. Remember, they flower on current season's growth, and so I always tend to say cut everything off but leave about six sets of buds. So with those, so that you can keep them where you want them. Otherwise, people plant them, they look so nice for three or four years when they're here, and then all of a sudden they're up here, and then they don't know what to do with them anymore. So, but pruning with the, again, with the hydrangeas, but a great season extenders. We've got pink forms. Now we got red, little things that go red. Quick fire turns them a little bit more red. Some of them come really early. So, you know, are they a season extender? Yeah, they're a summer extender. Again, a white lancer, the big ornamental grass in the middle. Uh, but probably the reason the slide is in here is for the castor bean that's in the middle. So I don't know if we extend much with the flowers, but for sure with the foliage there and if for height or whatever with that. So it's something different, and that's castor bean. Again, here I mentioned the, all the different salvias early, and leucantha is that purplish blue one that's there in the middle real butterfly magnets in the summer. And there's a lot of them, that other big tall yellow one is also at the, uh, I've seen at the garden. And then we go to all of the ornamental grasses. And how many of ornamental grasses, I mentioned the Calamagrasis, Brachytrica, or the fall feather reed grass, but um, here's more grass, M-O-O-R, Molinia. Okay, and that's real, I mean, they're real see-through. Your foliage is only up about maybe waist high, and then you've got the, the plumes and they're up, you know, they're up in your face. So some real height and you can even see through some of those. So more grass is another one of those big ones that's up there. Panicum, the Panicum virgatum or the switchgrass is another one. I, sometimes I find switchgrass to be a little bit aggressive for my taste because I don't have time to do all the division with it, but um, some of them, Cloud Nine and Heavy Metal, to me, kind of, and North Winds are three that probably maybe stay in place a little bit better. But Switchgrass, and then Carl Forster is the, the, the grass in the lower right, and then we got the Ornamental Millets. The Ornamental Millets are the annuals, and you got Purple Majesty was one of the first to, the first to come out, and now, I don't know, now there's eight or 10 of them, I think. Anyway, so you got the ornamental millets, and the, if you can watch the birds with those. Uh, okay, I sh kind of showed those before, but the brachytrica in the middle, and to the very right is that prairie drop seed. And then, uh, I hope I got little blue stem is the other one that I would say that we use a little bit as a season extender that's a little shorter. Okay, so little blue stem is another one of the ornamental grasses. And then all the different miscanthus, a uh, little high for me, but they're there and they're, they're season extenders late. Another one is the euphorbia. 
Diamond Frost. We all know Diamond Frost. I think that was one of the first ones to come out. I don't know if it's an All-America winner for next season, but there's a seed form now called Glamour. And Glamour you're going to see next season, and it will be a great annual. It will be, uh, may come up almost knee high, and as you plant one plant, it may be two, two and a half feet around. So the seed form of Euphorbia called Glamour is going to be a good annual. We've also got crabgrass down in the front, too. <laughs> Herbs, okay, think of all those parsleys. That the flat, the flat leaf, the curly leaf, so we've got parsley that we can add. As I mentioned, the, the uh, Plectranthus and Dusty Miller. I'm not a Dusty Miller fan, but we've had a couple of people that have requested it, and so we've used it. There's that Aster Tetericus, that big, tall, four or five footer, okay? Just remember, it's aggressive. Uh, the t the tree on the very right, it's hard to see. Well, I think I took this slide about two weeks ago because now I have an Acer truncatum uh, behind th that asteroid that's fully deep red in, in flower, in uh, leaf now. So, uh, fruits, okay, that's my picture for crab apples. No, that's not crab apple. That's um, Catoni ester. The many flowered Catoniaster, Catoniaster multiflorus, small scale tree, but a great white flower in the spring. And if you get the, the, the fruits in the sun, I, I happened to, when I seen this, it was in the late fall and the sun was to the back through it and it was just a big glow of red and so I had to have one. Catoniaster multiflorus. I don't see it around and used much, but Again, it's a great fruit season extender. Uh, some of the other Catoniasters, you know, the really tiny short ones have got pretty good flowers and fruit too. All right, crab apple. And now I don't know, is it a, I would question, is it an extender? Mine's, mine's bare of fruit now. The birds have got it stripped clean. So, you know, between, between that and my ilex, I don't have many fruits left. Hawthorn. Uh, this is the bulb that I included, and is it an extend? It's a summer extender, maybe. It's the cro the uh, colchicums, the fall crocus, and, and those. And so, you know, it, it was beautiful three weeks ago when I was taking pictures and putting all this together. I, I got a great season extender, and then we had that those that that Saturday night frost, and the next morning it was flatter than a pancake. Oh, fall color one, okay, this is the Korean pear, uh, Korean sun, the Pyrus foyorii, Korean sun, I think is the, anyway, Korean sun is the cult of our selection. And it's got that orangish red fall color, but it's much earlier than all the rest of the calorie pear, of all the pears. Because you know, most of them are now just beginning to turn, if they're turning yet. Most of them are glossy green yet. And then Acer triflorum is a little bit, little bit earlier than Acer japonicum and Acer griseum, the paperbark maple and the full moon maple and Acer truncatum. All of those got that really deep maroon red fall color. But this is Acer triflorum, the three-leaved maple, and it's again that kind of that orangey red. But again, another one of my favorites. Maybe it tolerates a little bit more salt than sugar maple. Okay, this is the plant that I, from Africa, and couldn't you see all of those from fall going into winter? Look at the winter ornaments there, but let's try to find it. Okay, there it is, the hairy balloon plant. Anybody ever heard of it? Anybody ever seen it? You've seen it? Okay. In D.C.? In Washington, D.C.? Okay, well, that's not zone four. <laughs> zone three, zone four. And so, and you know, the Chicago Botanic Garden, they do everything like that, and I, there's things that they may treat, I would imagine they treat it as an annual, but uh, it looked really good in those fruits. 
If I can back up. Those fruits, they look like little ornaments. I could just see those with frost on them in the morning or with a little bit of light snow on them. I mean, boy, that's, a, that's an extender into winter. And we really need some of that. There's one of those mums that was a, a reddish, a reddish to the outside and then the yellow to the inside. We'll see if we can't find this one. It's, that's the, the name of it, Saga Nashiki. So we'll see if we can, we'll see what we can do with that one. But you know, they do things in a big way there. Again, a public place. Mom's in, in baskets and hangers. That's the atrium as you walk through. And then they're hanging baskets that hang from all the different, a lot of the different uh, areas in the garden. And again, you know, things may be all the same so that there's a lot of continuity to plant things and things as you go through and as you see them. So just again, you know, what maybe I would say are some of our season extenders at least until Halloween and a couple of weeks beyond. So we're always a step ahead. Or at least try to be a step ahead. And there's a lot of materials to use. And so with all of that, you don't ever have to do the same thing twice. Again, we've got foliage, we've got flowers, you know, grasses, you got all the different things to think about to add and to put together. And so there's endless combinations. And again, all the different things, depending on what you want to do. So you got to let your imagination go and then try to find the things that fit what you're doing because you don't ever do the same thing twice. And I've had people tell me to do the same thing because you can't do it as good as you did it this year and it ends up that yes, it's always better than it was the year before. So with that, we'll go into some of our, this getting ready to, for winter, okay, things that I talked about. Um, and on your handout, I kind of went through, I went through my to-do thing list and I went through from beginning to end. And so maybe it doesn't fit exactly right or maybe some things that you do early, you can also do late or flip-flop back and forth. But for the most part, I think I started with early winter or early late fall first and ended with kind of like Christmas kind of things toward the end. Okay, so we extend color as long as we can. And then, and again, this season, I would say more than, well, it's maybe not more than any other, but at least as any other, is that we water well. And we don't water well in November, we water well in August and September and October. Now that's hard sometimes to, you know, to get across, the point to get across, but with all your evergreens and all your trees and all your shrubs, and even all your perennials. Remember your perennials, you know, buds for next season are all there. Whether they're up on top, like the coneflowers and the rudbeckias and those that, that got the foliage on the top now, or all of those that got buds underneath, the coreopsis, the peonies, um, hostas, all of those, you know, buds underground. And so remember that all of those things, you, you know, they're already ready for winter. So if we water in late November, you know, we're, we're not helping them. We're helping them, but we're not helping them as much as maybe we should if we do it earlier, okay? So water earlier. Um, leaf and debris cleanup. I'm gonna tell you that as far as, when I was putting this, the getting ready for winter, I'm, getting ready for winter for me is making sure that I've got fall things done. Uh, and winter is, is uh, extension of fall <laughs> for the for a lot for a lot of it we still do I I've planted trees with frost in the ground two feet deep you know we piled up some firewood and we burnt the whole taken the frost out of the ground planted the trees put the put everything back we did that in January and February and we did that because we didn't want to rut up the lawns so that's and bringing in some big 
four inch and five inch trees, you know, that's how we could do it. You plowed the snow to keep the paths open and let the frost go in, then you went in and you burnt holes. And so there's always a way to do something that's not in season or when maybe you would think about it. And as gardeners, we're always innovative and we're always doing that. So leaf and debris cleanup, you know, do you, how clean do you have it? Uh, some customers, it's got to be spick and span. I don't want to see hardly anything. And then the next one, we can leave it go till spring, can't we? It's so, it, you know, you do it when you can, maybe one, as how much time do you have? Time is a big factor now, you know, these days. Time, time, we don't have enough time to do much of anything. We definitely don't have time to put all our containers together and do all of that. So time is, is very, very important. So when you've got time and got the window of opportunity, you know, that's when you do it. Uh, rose bushes and rose bush protection, now with all the shrub roses, I don't do, the only protection I can say that I do is for hybrid teas. And we'll come through, as we do leaf cleanup now, and we do the soil mounding over top of the graft union and the bud unions and those, and then they sit until they freeze. And then we come back in with evergreen boughs, and that's kind of phase two. So, you know, some years it's Christmas, some years it's been, like last year we froze up right around Halloween, had a hard time doing containers and greens in containers for holiday because they were frozen solid. I don't know if you remember that, but I remember that the week before Thanksgiving already. So we, the, we play the, the weather game there. Uh, and so that protection for the rose bushes, you know, again, it, that, that second wave of, of protection. Because they, once you would get them frozen, you want them to stay frozen. You don't want this freeze thaw, freeze thaw. That's why maybe El Nino, is it good for us or not? It's good if we get a good snow cover and then we don't lose it. But who knows if we, you know, and we deal with it every year. Uh, so again, bait for mice. Again, I think that's pretty important because, you know, you may not have some crowns left of some plants if you don't, a Siberian iris and catnip are a couple of, other, a couple of those that for sure we see every year that, that the mice are in if we don't either bait or clean up. And we I typically to bait, we, I, I use the little bait packets and uh, I cut like PVC pipe, inch and a half, and make it about like toilet roll things and then we put it right in the, right in the runways and right under the plants. Then the, the cats won't get it, but, you know, Dogs and cats won't get in it. So that's one way. And if I, in the hybrid teas, typically we'll put it, I put it again right at the bud union before we put our compost over the top. So that there's bait there if they get there because uh, if they make a home there, they, they got winter food all winter long with your rose bushes. Uh, then we got bulb planting. How many got their bulbs in the ground already? How many are done? Few? How many haven't started yet? Okay. <laughs> so, but bulb planting, the big thing is that they root before they freeze. It doesn't matter, I was, it doesn't matter I, as many times as I've made some little studies and whether do you plant them point side up, do you plant them, you know, point side down, do you get them in, however. Um, I was told it doesn't matter how I put them in as long as I get them in the ground. So, and we did that last year because of it being so frozen <laughs> and when we were bulb planting, we kind of dug a hole, we threw five bulbs in it and covered it up. And do you think I could tell what, what happened this spring? Uh -uh. At least with tulips. That, so that was my, that was my um, word that's worked for me, <laughs> okay? Uh, winterizing, again, water features and pumps, if you've got any of that kind of stuff, you know, that's probably pretty early. Water lines probably can wait a little bit longer, but if you've got pumps up out of the ground and those kinds of things, those kinds of things, you probably wanna make sure that you take care of those 
um, earlier rather than later. And then I typically, we do compost in flower beds in the fall every year. Again, as we're bulb planting, that's when we add our compost to them. And now this year, I'm adding our white mold treatments to fall. Because I've seen some, we've had at least where we do annual season after season after season, is I'm beginning to see some white mold, especially as we use zinnias. And so we're kind of trying to cycle out of zinnias in some of those beds, and then we're treating for white mold. And now, I think the one recommendation I had was to do it in the fall. So that's happening. Now, turn of, turning in the vegetable garden, uh, I think that's important in the fall rather than waiting till spring. And all your, you know, again, all the grass clippings that go into that or the leaf mold or whatever, as you turn all of that into your, into your garden. Uh, the rose bush protection phase two, again, are the evergreen boughs. And I only do it on hybrid teas. If anything, on the, on the shrub roses, some of them I may dump a pile of compost in the middle of it, but I don't do much, much more than that. Dormant pruning, I, I put it here because you can do it if you want in the fall. As soon as everything's dropped their leaves or we've got all the fall color now and everything, you can probably prune. Spirea, potentillas, hydrangeas, uh, all of that, all of that stuff. All of the, anything that flowers on new wood in the summer, you can, you can prune dormant. So I just tend to do it spring rather than fall because I'm doing summer and fall catch up rather than, at that point, rather than uh, spring. And then again, you've got holiday decorating later and then um, whatever containers, if you've got those ceramic containers and things, you probably can't leave them out. I at least tip them upside down. Um, and then from there, you know, for me at least, it goes to spring orders and everything for the next season. And in fact, that's late because I think now I've probably got 80% of it already done. Uh, but that's then, and then our leaf piles. And I always pile leaves by my vegetable garden because I use them all summer there. So I make my leaf piles late. <laughs> With that, I'll open it to questions. <laughs>